Okay, today we are talking about alcohol. I'll let you know that we would have an alcohol chapter coming up, and here it is. So alcohol is one of our more commonly used drugs. Today, I hope you do learn a bit about, you know, the history of alcohol, how alcohol is made, and some other things. All right. All right. So we're going to start off with the basics. So fermentation. The word fermentation is the production of alcohol from sugars through the action of yeasts. Okay. This forms the basis for all alcoholic beverages. Now, different beverages are going to have different raw materials. So fruit contains sugar, and fruit is going to ferment with the addition of yeast. Interestingly, if you've ever left fruit out too long, it will start on its own to ferment. If you've had juice in your refrigerator too long, it will start to ferment. And you'll notice that if you take a drink or if you take a bite, um, if you've chosen to do that, you'll notice it tastes kind of like alcohol. That's exactly what's happening. Okay. Now, cereal grains require malt to convert starch into sugar. Okay. And so that is going to be for some of our specific beverages. Now, Here's the thing, yeast actually has a limited tolerance for alcohol. So when the concentration reaches about 12 to 15%, the yeast dies and fermentation stops. Okay, so naturally things reach about a 12 to 15% alcohol level. Okay, now let's talk about some other things. So distillation, distilled products. So what we do here is you have evaporation and condensing of alcohol vapors to produce beverages with higher alcohol content. So as I said, if naturally things get to about 12 to 15 percent, you have to then go through the distillation process, evaporating, condensing, to create those higher alcohol content products. There's ideas that this process was maybe discovered in Arabia around AD 800. That's, you know, just a guess. Introduced to Europe in about the 10th century. Okay. Another vocabulary word here, and these are things that you may know and maybe you don't know, but the word proof. So if you look at any alcohol beverage, it will say what its proof is, and this is a number. So the proof is a measure of the beverage's alcohol content. <clears throat> and it's actually twice the percentage of alcohol by weight. So for example, if you see that a whiskey is 90 proof, it means that that, that beverage is 45% alcohol. Okay, so 90 proof whiskey is 45% alcohol. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a um, little sneeze there, or a big sneeze there. So when you look at alcohol beverages, you can see what the proof is and then divide that in half and that'll give you the percent of alcohol. Let's talk about beer. So beer has become, somewhat recently, but a very connoisseur type of thing. So for a long time we had our, you know, general few different beers that people chose and now of course everybody is interested in the craft beers the microbreweries the nano breweries we'll get there there's really three types of beer the first is an ale and an ale uses what they call top fermentation yeast and what they do is they actually ferment the beer at a warm temperature and for a shorter duration of fermentation. Those are your ales. And then we have our lagers. Our lagers are the most common in the US. So our, your big beer companies, if you think of, those are lagers. It uses a type of yeast that actually settles to the bottom of the mash when it ferments. And so then they're using a cooler temperature 
and a slower or longer fermentation process. So things are being done a bit differently here. Now, light beer. Light beer is fermented longer at a cooler temperature. More sugar is converted to alcohol. And then they add water. Some people say, oh, my light beer tastes like water. Yes. Yes, it does. There's a reason for that. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's not a good thing, depending on how you feel about your beer. Um, but it's actually that the alcohol content is higher, and then they add water. So then the alcohol content of the whole thing then is the same. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so those are our generally our three types. Now, going back, um, hold on, there we go. So going back, like I said, though, um, there are lots of different types of beers now, lots of different types of companies. Um, when people talk about like a microbrewery, interestingly, even things like Sam Adams is technically a microbrewery because they don't produce as much as, you know, your Coors, your Budweiser, those kind of groups. Um, and then you have what you call your nano breweries, which are legal in some places and not legal in other places. Birmingham, if you are watching this from somewhere else and don't live here, Birmingham has had a big rise in these local breweries. Um, and a lot of them are pretty popular at this point. Um, but that is new within the past few years. Before, people were allowed to brew, well, first they weren't allowed to. And then they were allowed to have the brewery, but they couldn't have a what you'd call a tasting room. Now they do have that. Um, so you can now currently in Birmingham brew beer and sell that beer in the same location. This is, like I said, new in the past couple of years. So there's that. Um, and I just think it's interesting how laws continue to change. Um, let's move on to wine. So wine is made from fermented grapes typically. Actually, here in Alabama, a lot of times it's made from fermented muscadine, um, but that's just kind of special to hear. There's a few other places that will use your muscadine instead of grapes, but typically wine is made from fermented grapes produced by both small and really large wineries. Most wines contain about 12% alcohol. That's pretty typical. It varies a little bit. Um, factors in quality, well, gosh, there's so many things. Selection, cultivation of the grape vines. The weather plays a huge part in this. The timing of harvest. And then, like it says here, really careful monitoring of fermentation, careful monitoring of aging. It depends, you know, what kind of barrels they put things in. It depends um, what else is placed in those barrels. It depends. There are so many things that it depends on, right? Um, I always like to throw this out there. I went to undergrad in Sonoma, California. Sonoma is known for its wine countries, uh, wine country, let's say countries, because there's like Napa and all that stuff too. Um, and all of our dorms were named after wines, which is kind of interesting as an 18-year-old at the time going and living in dorms and you'd go visit your friends in other dorms that were all named after wines. And for years, I had emotional feelings about different wines based on whether or not I liked the people that lived in that dorm. I didn't drink Rieslings for years, um, uh, which is kind of silly. And um, I do now. That's my, my choice. In moderation, of course. Small amounts, moderation. Um, so there's that. Let's move on here. Um, oh yeah, I guess also one other thing is that at my college you could major in wine management, you could major in some other um, veterinary kind of options. Now, our varieties of wine. You've got your generics versus your varietals. That's really determined by the type of grape, the flavor, you have your red versus white. You have your sweet versus dry. You have your sparkling wines. Sparkling wines are not supposed to be called champagne unless they come from the sh from well champagne. Um, 
but sometimes people call them those things anyway. And then you have your fortified wines, and fortified wines tend to have higher alcohol contents. Now, if you want to read more about how to make different wines like red versus white, it really depends on the grapes. Um, your rosé wines tend to be red grapes that have been peeled. Um, and there's a lot of information there. If that's something you're interested in, feel free to do some more reading on it. But it's not essential to know as far as just learning about what alcohol does to our bodies. Okay. Let's talk about distilled spirits. So here we're talking about our grain-neutral spirits. Grain-neutral spirits are actually clear, they're tasteless, and they're nearly pure alcohol. So 190 proof, do some math there. It's produced by that distillation. Remember, we just talked about that. Now, grain neutral spirits were sold as Everclear, and they were also used in research. Everclear went off the market and was illegal for a while because it can be so dangerous, because people can put a little bit of Everclear into some sort of punch. Um, and end up with a lot of intensely drunk, intoxicated um, people and deaths or um, people passing out and being you know, taken advantage of often happens in these situations. Again, if something, if a beverage is made in a cooler, not like beverages put in a cooler, but if a beverage is made in a cooler um, and you didn't make it, Maybe don't drink it. Um, Everclear has come back onto the market and is sold in um, certain, certain variations. Now, then this grain neutral spirit is used to make all of these other alcohols. So gin, for example. Gin is the grain neutral spirit distilled, filtered through juniper berries, which is what gives them that specific gin taste, juniper berries, and then diluted with water, okay? Vodka is just that grain neutral spirit in water. Um, and of course, all the other different alcohols start with the grain neutral spirits, and then are filtered through different things to give them their specific taste. Water is added, on so on and so on there. Um, these things contain relatively few um, what we call, uh, I say congeners. I know other people pronounce it differently. Those are things that are other alcohols and other oils that tend to be contained in alcoholic beverages. So you're going to have more of those in things with lower proof. You're going to have few of those things in things that are higher proof. All right, so whiskey. Let's talk whiskey a little bit here. This is now distilled from fermented grain. It's a little bit different here. It's distilled at a lower proof, so it's 160 rather than 190 of the other. So it contains more of those congeners and some flavor from the grain whiskey. Um, usually aged for at least two years. Your types of whiskey are going to include rye whiskey, right? So it's from the rye grain. Um, corn whiskey, which we actually call bourbon. So that's what bourbon is. It's corn whiskey. And then there's lots of whiskey blends. All right. Let's talk here. So early U.S. views on alcohol. Before the American Revolution, People drank way more alcohol than water, okay? And drunkenness was actually viewed as a misuse of a positive product. Now, why did people drink more alcohol than water? Well, water was actually dangerous at times, right? Um, if, if you've ever seen some of these survival shows that are on right now, some of them are kind of awesome, um, they will show you that if you drink water straight from you know, a pool of water that's been sitting somewhere that is, you know, a lake, obviously can't drink water from the ocean, um, or, you know, some sort of other place, there's a lot of contaminants in there that can make you very sick. Now, when people made alcohol, 
they got rid of those contaminants. And so drinking alcohol in moderation gave you hydration without the risk of getting some sort of horrible stomach virus, um, some sort of parasite. Now, eventually people realized that it wasn't necessarily the alcohol that was helping, but when you're making alcohol, people were boiling the water, okay? Boiled, now of course we have filtered, all sorts of filtration systems for our water, and you should be drinking more water than alcohol, in case you didn't know that. Um, but at the time, people drank more alcohol, and it wasn't a problem because if you saw drunk people, you just thought, well, that is a misuse, that person has an issue. Now, after the American Revolution, alcohol itself was viewed as the cause of a serious problem. And it was really the first substance to become demonized in American culture. So all of a sudden, people were saying, wait, alcohol is horrible, alcohol is bad, alcohol is the problem. So, come on. Uh oh, where did my screen go? Hmm, it's messing with me here. Hold on. What's going on? Resume slideshow. Ooh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So then we have something called the temperance movement. And this was really started by Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush wrote a pamphlet called An Inquiry into the Effects of Ardent Spirits on the Mind and Body. And he noticed that heavy drinking led to health problems. There were also these ideas that alcohol use damages what they call morality. Alcohol addiction is a disease. So interestingly, a long time ago, people thought of it as this is a disease. Now, people developed these things called temperance societies. And originally, the temperance societies just promoted abstinence from the distilled spirits, but beer and wine was okay. And later, though, it just promoted total abstinence. And it became really trendy to do what they'd call take the pledge. And the pledge just basically means, you know, saying, I will not use alcohol. I will sign my name and say, I am not going to use alcohol, period. Now, then, of course, legally people got involved. So prohibition. States began passing prohibition laws in 1851. By 1917, 64% of Americans lived in what we call dry territories. Of course, as always, the laws reflected issues of class, ethnicity, religion, immigration. Now, federal prohibition, the 18th Amendment, 1919. I don't ask you to memorize a lot of dates, but I am going to ask you for this one. The 18th Amendment is in 1919. It banned the sale of alcohol. Now, that's just the law. People still drink illegally in places called speakeasies and private clubs, um, also legally purchased through patent medicines. So, and if you ever known somebody who's very addicted to alcohol um, and they don't have access to alcohol, they will drink cough syrups, um, other medicines that contain some alcohol. Enforcement of the 18th Amendment was challenging because it actually made organized crime more organized. So there was some negative outcomes here, right? So all of a sudden, people still wanted alcohol. And so it made it so that these speakeasies, private clubs, organized crime really got together, got more organized so that people could still continue to drink alcohol. Um, enforcement was also expensive. Um, alcohol dependence and alcohol-related deaths did decline at this time, okay? So it, it did improve those things. However, financially, legally, it was extremely difficult. Okay, so then, so remember, 
18th Amendment, 1919, repealed by the 21st Amendment, 1933. Why? Why did they repeal it? Well, money is one of those things. Alcohol taxes. Oh my gosh, like half of what you pay for alcohol goes to taxes. So it was a huge source of revenue. Once the alcohol taxes went away, you had to say, well, what else will we tax? Um, and sometimes we call this the sin tax, S-I-N tax uh, for alcohol, you know, other things like that that are uh, taxed. So they had been a huge source of revenue. Without them, it was a problem. There was also just this concern about widespread disrespect for the 18th Amendment. And so the prohibition laws actually encouraged a general sense of lawlessness, because once you were breaking that law, maybe you were more likely to break other laws. So outcomes of the repeal. Alcohol per capita sale and consumption increased. And actually, after World War II, consumptions and sales returned to pre-prohibition levels. Okay. Um, regulation after 1933. Some states remained dry initially, but most allowed beer sales. Mississippi was the last dry state. It allowed alcohol purchase and consumption in 1966. Now, while all, there are no dry states left, there are dry counties. There are dry counties here in Alabama. If you are driving through one of those dry counties with a bunch of alcohol in your car, you can get in trouble. Um, in 1970s, drinking ages were lowered to 18 and 19 in 30 states. There was this idea that, you know, if people were allowed to go to war, why were they not allowed to drink alcohol? But then they were raised again to 21 following safety concerns, including a lot of driving safety. Um, and actually, the way that they kind of convince different states to make rules is they say things like, look, we're not giving you any more dollars for your roads, your highways, your roads. They're yours. We will not give you any more money for them unless you agree to change uh, the age to 21. And eventually the states give in and say, OK, fine, we need your federal money. We'll change it. Taxation. Federal and state taxes and licensing fees are about half the price of an alcoholic beverage. So if you go out and you think, holy moly, I am paying so much for this alcoholic beverage. Yes, you are. It doesn't mean that somebody in that bar or restaurant is getting real rich off of it, but a lot of it goes to taxes. About half of it is going to taxes and licensing fees. When taxes go up, consumption goes down, but not dramatically. In times of recession, people still go to the bar. Bars do quite well, interestingly. You'd think that people would stop spending the money on it, but what they do is stop spending the money on other things and continue to buy alcohol. Consumption patterns tend to be influenced by cultural factors. So trends in the US alcohol consumption are similar to other drugs. Alcohol use peaked in 1981 and then declined. Um, so alcohol use is actually not as high now as it was in 81. We still have a lot of problems, especially with binge use currently. American co consumption per person per year. This is on average. So this means that a lot of people drink way more than this. And a lot of people don't drink at all or drink very little. So beer, 27 gallons, which is over one gallon of alcohol. Spirits, about 0.75 gallons of alcohol. Wine, about 0.33 gallons of alcohol. Here's a graph, alcohol consumption over time. Feel free to stop on it and then pick this back up. Regional differences. About a third of the US population actually abstains from using alcohol. Half of the alcohol consumed is by 10% of the drinkers. So about a third don't drink at all. So about two thirds of the US population do drink. 
about half of the alcohol that is consumed by those two thirds is actually consumed by 10% of those two thirds, if that makes sense. So some people are drinking a lot. Alcohol sales are higher in population centers. Um, so DC, cities in Nevada, um, these are just due to statistics. You know, this is not giving you a why, but this is, it is. So there's that. Here are our alcohol consumption by state. I invite you to stay on this one as long as you want, kind of looking over things. It's also in your book, of course. I'm going to move on, but feel free to stop here. Gender differences. Now, these are things that are statistics. These are things that are generalizations here, okay? There's always exceptions to these rules. Males are more likely to drink than females. Males are likely to drink more than females. Um, college students drink more than their non-student peers. Many campuses have banned sale and advertising of alcohol. Many fraternities have banned keg parties. Um, there is some evidence that this is helping. Maybe fewer students binge drink. Maybe fewer students drive after drinking. Um, it's still a huge problem. Thousands of people die each year at colleges due to acute alcohol toxicity. Okay, um, They're not always reported, but I think it would be horrible to think you've worked so hard uh, and then you go off to college and you die from binge drinking. Um, I think it would be awful to think of being a parent and sending your child off to college um, thinking you're doing the right thing and then they end up dying from binge drinking. So what is one drink? When we say, well, you can have one drink an hour, one drink every two hours. Well, one drink is about 0.5 ounces of pure alcohol, which is 12 ounces of beer, four ounces of wine, or one ounce of 100 proof spirits, okay? Um, a shot is about 1.5 ounces, but usually you're not taking something that's 100 proof. Well, maybe you are. I don't know what you're doing, but think about that. So a shot glass is 1.5 ounces. Four ounces of wine is maybe less than you think. So when people say, well, one glass of red wine is good for you. Yeah, four ounces, four ounces, not one glass, meaning your giant wine glass that you bought. All right, let's go pharmacology. Most is absorbed through the small intestine. Some of it is absorbed in the stomach. Now, absorption is gonna be slower if there is food or water already in the stomach. It's gonna be slower. It doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. The only thing that's gonna make it faster is the presence of carbonated beverages. So if you um, combine your alcohol with a soda or something else with carbonation, the absorption is gonna happen faster and you're gonna notice the changes in perception based on drinking. So you will feel drunk faster. I remember hearing people be like, well, if you drink it out of a straw, it goes straight to your head. That's, that's not a real thing. It's a straw. It still goes down your throat the same way. That's, that's not real. Carbonated beverages actually do make a difference. Um, having food and water in your stomach is a very good idea if you're choosing to drink. You can always choose not to, but if you're choosing to drink, having some protein, having some food, water in your stomach ahead of time, real good idea. Now, distribution. We have our BAC or our blood alcohol concentration. The BAC is the measure of the concentration of alcohol in your blood. It's expressed as a percentage in terms of grams per 100 milliliters. Okay, alcohol is distributed through the body fluids, but not fatty tissues. Okay, again, alcohol is distributed through the body fluids, but not through fatty tissues. So a lean person will have a lower blood alcohol content than a fatter person of the same weight. 
So let me say this in a different way. So if I am a lean person and I have a friend who is a heavier person, but it's because they're fatter, they actually cannot drink more than I can. I mean, they can, but if we drink the same amount, even if this person weighs a lot more than I do, if they weigh a lot more than I do because they're fatter, and we drink the same amount, we will have the same blood alcohol content. Often people who are very big think, well, I'm big, so therefore I can, I can drink more and have a lower blood alcohol concentration. Wrong. Um, if this doesn't make sense, go ahead and look in your book and see if the examples that they give on this are, make more sense to you. But again, um, distributed through the body, but not actually the fatty tissues. So metabolism. The liver metabolizes about 0.25 ounces of alcohol per hour. The rate of intake equals the rate of metabolism. So, no, sorry. If the rate of intake equals the rate of metabolism, then your blood alcohol concentration is stable. So if you're only drinking 0.25 ounces of alcohol per hour, of course, this does change based on your weight. But... Um, and body fat percentages. But this is just a generalization here. If the rate of intake exceeds the rate of metabolism, which is typically how people drink, your blood alcohol concentration increases. So about 90% of alcohol is metabolized in the liver. It is hard on your liver. About 2% of alcohol is excreted unchanged, so meaning it just kind of comes out in your breath, you sweat it out, you pee it out. Metabolism is based on a stable rate, okay? You always hear people say like, oh, just have some coffee and it'll sober you up. No, 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 that's not real. Oh, just, um, you know, have some bread and it'll soak it up. Bread does not soak up alcohol and then it, like, where is it going? It's still in your body. Like even if the bread sucked it up in your stomach, you still have alcohol in your body. That makes no sense at all. Um, anyway, sorry, I was just thinking about that for a second. Exercise, coffee, other strategies, nothing is going to speed up your rate of metabolism. The only way to sober up is time. The only way to sober up is by sitting and waiting it out. If you drink coffee, it will confuse your brain because of the caffeine. And it will make you think that you are no longer intoxicated, but you are. And it actually is quite dangerous because people think that they can drive, but they should not be driving. Okay? Do know this. That's important. Just for your life. Okay, the liver responds to chronic intake of alcohol by increasing enzyme activity. So this contributes to tolerance among heavy users. So the liver responds, if you drink alcohol and alcohol and alcohol and alcohol, the liver starts having this increased enzyme activity and this is its new normal. And then it has that new normal and you have to up your alcohol use and up your alcohol use and up your alcohol use until you die um, or you stop drinking so much, hopefully the second. For heavy alcohol users, when alcohol is present, metabolism of other drugs is slower. And when alcohol is not present, metabolism of other drugs is faster. So alcohol is one of the few drugs that just really changes your body. It changes your brain. It can change your brain permanently. It can change your liver permanently. It can change your body and the, your metabolism and your functioning permanently if used in high doses for a period of time. Okay. Um, women may be more susceptible to men to the, than men to the effects of alcohol after consuming the same amount. Now, one of the reasons is that women tend to be smaller than men. However, um, they also tend to have a higher pro proportion of body fat, so women absorb a greater proportion of alcohol that they drink.
But also, interestingly, in women, the alcohol dehydrogenase <laughs> um, is less active. So therefore, this metabolism process is happening somewhat differently in women. So again, women are more susceptible than men to the effects of alcohol after consuming the same amount. Therefore, women should drink less alcohol. Okay. Um, mechanism of action. So in general, alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. Like many things, the exact mechanism of action is not clear. Um, alcohol has a lot of effects on the central nervous system. It enhances the inhibitory effects of GABA at the GABA-A receptor. It's similar to barbiturates and benzodiazepines that we learned about in the last, well, when was that, two chapters ago. Um, at high doses, alcohol blocks glutamate, which is not good. Um, alcohol also affects dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine neurons. Um, going back to alcohol blocking glutamate, we need glutamate is, our sh is basically the sugar that we need to keep our brains going. If we stop it, it doesn't feed our brains. And that is very bad. Okay. Behavioral effects. So mood changes, maybe euphoria, reduced anxiety, reduced inhibitions. Effects are really dose dependent. So blood alcohol concentration determines the effects. So at low levels, you may have difficulties with complex or abstract behaviors. At higher levels, you're going to have problems with walking and talking. Effects depend on the time course. So greater effects when it, you know, your blood alcohol concentration rises rapidly. So if you're taking shots, um, it's going to happen fast, right? If you are drinking a glass of wine over the course of an hour, it's a lot slower, right? Effects are influenced by the individual's alcohol experience. So you may have a higher blood alcohol concentration needed to impair a chronic heavy drinker. So you may know somebody who can drink a lot and don't appear to be impaired. That's not a good sign. That's a very bad sign. Um, that means that that person's body is so used to alcohol, chronic heavy alcohol use, that it's not being that impaired by how much they're drinking. Um, so alcohol experience, of course, makes a difference. Um, you know, and somebody who's having their first drink may feel pretty intoxicated after one drink. Somebody who's been drinking a long time, you don't see the same thing. Okay. Effect, uh, let's start over. I tripped over that word, and it's a simple one. Effects are influenced by expectations. Okay. This is great. So, for example, placebo effects explain many effects on social behavior. So, there are all these studies that have been done where they bring people together and they give them what they think is alcohol, and it's not. Okay? So, whether they do that with non-alcoholic beer, and people start drinking, and they're just kind of doing what they do, and then as they drink more, they become more social, and as they drink more, they become louder, and they become more chatty, and they become louder, even though they're not actually drinking alcohol. Okay, so that's, that would be like beer. I love, I love these studies. The way that they do um, other ones are with, they basically make screwdrivers. So a screwdriver is a beverage that contains orange juice and vodka, okay? So what they do, because you might think, well, if somebody gave me a fake drink, I would know if there's no alcohol in it. Mm-hmm, I think you would. So what they do is they place, um, let me start with this. So they soak a towel in vodka, towel soaked in vodka. And then they take glasses and they leave them upside down on the towel for a good period of time. Um, and then they create a concoction of sort of basically like orange juice and um, 
water or whatever it is. So when you pick up, of course, you don't get to see the towel soaked in it. You just get the drink. So when you take a drink of that orange juice and water, you are smelling the alcohol on the rim of the glass. You are tasting the alcohol on the rim of the glass. And you believe that you are drinking. Um, you're welcome to try this with your friends. Uh, always entertaining, especially if you know somebody has actually been drinking and they maybe shouldn't be drinking anymore. Feel free to make them a fake drink. Uh, they're probably to the point where they won't notice anyway, and it would be much better. Um, so there's that. Lots of good studies on these kinds of placebo effects with alcohol. Now, blood alcohol levels and behavioral effects. Here's, again, another good chart to take a look at. Maybe you've known somebody who used a breathalyzer and had a blood alcohol concentration of one of these. Maybe somebody you know got arrested or a DUI and you know what their blood alcohol concentration was. You can see where this is. People who are heavy chronic drinkers end up with really high blood alcohol concentrations and they're still functioning somehow, which again is really scary because they're really close to the LD50, the lethal dose for 50% of animal models. Um, so sometimes people are actually still functioning, however, they're very close to the lethal dose. Um, I think having, if you're choosing to drink, if you're someone who is choosing to drink alcohol, having a um, breathalyzer that you keep on your keychain or that you keep with you somewhere is kind of a good idea because then you can keep track of what's going on with you. You can know, you can blow into that thing before you get in a car. You can have a friend blow into it before they drive you somewhere. Um, you can keep track of what you're doing. I'm a huge fan of keeping track of what you're drinking if you're choosing to drink. So, you know, keep a bunch of rubber bands on one wrist and for every drink you have, move a rubber band over to the next wrist. Then at least you keep track of it. Um, I think with college drinking, a lot of times is you lose track of what you've been drinking because it's just socializing and it's just kind of happening. Um, get a Sharpie and put a mark on your arm for every drink that you have. Um, these are okay things. Driving under the influence. Approximately 40% of all traffic crash fatalities are linked to alcohol use. 2011 date, 11 data indicate that total fatalities have dropped to about 32,000. It's still a lot. Um, however, some of the new things that we have, like the Uber programs, um, ride sharing, have really been helpful. Um, the more public transportation we have, the less likely people are to get in a car and drive when they've been drinking. Um, Birmingham is not very good about this. A lot of people in Birmingham drink and, and drive. Um, and I hope that these things do change sometime soon. Risk of fatal crash is dose related. So a sharp increase in fatalities with blood alcohol concentrations over 0.1. Men are more likely than women to be involved in alcohol-related fatal crashes. The majority of alcohol-related individuals are not problem drinkers. So this is not just like, oh, well, that only happens with people that are, you know, alcoholics. No, this is actually pretty typical with just regular drinkers. Okay. Behavioral effects. What happens is when you're using alcohol, your frontal lobe, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. Your prefrontal cortex is essential for making decisions that are human decisions, right? Like thinking about the future. When your prefrontal cortex shuts down, you're basically an animal. And that's why you're like, hmm, I don't really know that person very well, but I think I'll go home and sleep with them. Or huh, that person's kind of making me mad. I think I'm going to walk over there and punch them in the face. Seems to make sense in the moment because your brain's not working. So alcohol may enhance interest in sex, 
Um, however, alcohol may impair your ability to have sex. Um, it is linked, of course, to risky sexual behavior. Risky meaning not using a condom, having sex with somebody you don't know very well, those kinds of things. Blackouts. Blackouts are a danger sign of excessive alcohol use. If you are blacking out, that's not a funny story. Um, that is a warning sign. Crime and violence. Alcohol use is statistically related to homicide, assault, um, sexual assault, date rape, suicide. Sometimes because somebody is drunk, they don't really know what they're doing and they may act like, I hate to say accidentally rape somebody, but they may have in their head that this is an okay thing to do, where if they were sober, they would know better. Again, you got to be really careful. This is a dangerous drug. Going back to blackouts, there's also vomiting. Do I have that on the next one here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Um, yes, sorry. Peripheral circulation. So dilation of the peripheral, peripheral blood vessels happens. So interestingly, because of this, when you drink, you think you're getting warm, you think you're hot, but you're actually losing body heat. So that is confusing. Um, that is something that you have to be aware of. Like, don't go walking outside in the snow because you think you're warm. Um, fluid balance. Alcohol has a diuretic effect. So it increases urine flow. It lowers blood pressure in some individuals. Um, so if you think, gosh, I pee more when I'm drinking, yes, you do. Hormonal effects. Chronic alcohol abusers develop a variety of hormone-related disorders, including disruptive reproduction functioning. Now, um, here's a picture. Oh my gosh, these people are having so much fun. So um, anyway, alcohol overdose actually somewhat common and very, very dangerous. If somebody drinks enough to pass out, please don't leave that person alone. You need to put the person on their side and you need to monitor their breathing. Or if you feel like you're not in a place to do that, you need to take them to the emergency room. Sometimes people don't take people to the hospital because they think they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to get that person in trouble you will be in much, much more trouble if that person dies because you didn't feel like getting them to the hospital. You don't want to leave the person alone because you need to monitor breathing. You need to place the person on their side because if they vomit while they are passed out and they're on their backs, they can then choke on their vomit and die. This, this often goes to and die, okay? Um, so you want the person on their side minimum because then if they vomit, they're more likely to vomit out of their mouth rather than back into their throats. If somebody drinks enough to throw up, this is a one of those warning signs, right? This is your body saying, I am poisoned. You have poisoned me and I am going to vomit to get rid of the poison. If your body is saying you're poisoned and you should vomit, you need to stop drinking. If you've ever known that person that throws up so they can continue drinking, this is really possibly the worst idea. Vomiting, let me say this, the vomiting reflex is actually suppressed at blood alcohol concentrations of 0.2. Because your body tells you, I need to vomit, it means stop drinking. If you then continue drinking and your blood alcohol concentration is above 0.2, you may not have the ability to vomit. And then your body just maintains, keeps the poison and doesn't tell you that it's a problem. And it can then reach lethal levels pretty quickly. What's a hangover? Mm, not really understood that well. Upset stomach, fatigue, headache, thirst, depression, anxiety, generally feeling crappy. Possible causes, it could be alcohol withdrawal. It could be exposure to that other stuff that's in alcohol. 
It could be dehydration. It could be gastric irritation. It could be reduced blood sugar um, or the accumulation of um, the acetylhyde. Dehyde. Um, could be a lot of these things. Probably a combination of these things. Drinking water is really good. Eating food is a really good idea. Um, maybe not drinking alcohol excessively would help. Um, but there are precautions you can take. Here is a liver. You don't want this one. This is bad liver. Um, this liver, I'm jumping down here to the bottom first. This is liver disease. This is, you can have, you can end up with hepatitis. You can end up with a fatty liver or cirrhosis of the liver. When your liver is bad, your body stops functioning well. When your body stops functioning well because your liver is so, so bad, you may be at the point where you have to be in the hospital. And they may tell you, you are going to die unless you have a liver transplant. Now, there are a lot of people on the liver transplant list. Some of those people got it from drinking. Some of those people just happen to have it. If you need a liver transplant because of heavy drinking, your likelihood of getting to the top of the liver transplant list is not good. You have to prove that you can maintain sobriety for a certain period of time. And if you survive that period of time, then you are still not all that likely to be the one that's given the, the donor liver. Um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, um, but I have worked in transplant units before um, doing evaluations for people. And this is just kind of how the system works. Let's go up here. So cardio, um, heart disease. You can have cardiomyopathy, heart attacks, hypertension, stroke. Um, moderate use of alcohol may actually reduce heart attack risk, but when I say moderate, I mean one glass, four ounces of wine, red wine specifically, um, occasionally. Okay, let's go up to brain tissue loss and cognitive impairment. There's something called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. People typically just call it Korsakoff syndrome. Korsakoff syndrome is basically when you have been drinking chronically and you have a deficiency in certain vitamins, your brain permanently, well, not always permanently, but often permanently gets messed up, okay? Often this happens when people are drinking and not eating food. Because people get to the point where they're drinking so much alcohol, they either spend their money on alcohol and don't have money for food, or they are so drunk that they forget to eat. So that's a problem. Um, taking, if you know somebody who has a serious issue with alcohol, at least getting them to eat food and taking vitamin supplements can be kind of helpful. Um, but people with Korsakoff syndrome have impairments in their memory, but interestingly, they also lie about it. So as to where other people with dementias kind of notice that they don't know what they're talking about, people with Korsakoff syndrome will create, like fabricate these stories and then stick to them, intensely stick to them, which I think is interesting. Um, Korsakoff syndrome, I would recommend looking this up. I will give you the challenge of finding out what vitamin is deficient in people with Korsakoff syndrome. Okay, again, what vitamins deficient in people with Korsakoff syndrome? Make sure to look that up. I know, by the way. Um, but I'm giving you a challenge. All right, fetal alcohol syndrome. If you remember when we've talked about um, even that whole crack baby phenomenon and how that maybe wasn't what it said it was, fetal alcohol syndrome is real. With people who are addicted to alcohol and they are pregnant and the baby is born addicted to alcohol, this baby often has facial and developmental abnormalities. It's related to peak blood alcohol concentrations and to the duration of alcohol exposure. Okay, So I want to be really clear that this is a horrible thing. 
Um, and this is something that doesn't go away. People don't recover from fetal alcohol syndrome. They will always have growth retardation um, before or after birth, patterns of abnormal features in the face and head, evidence of central nervous system abnormalities, um, and often mental retardation. Okay. Um, but I also want to say that this is, again, related to peak alcohol concentrations, blood alcohol concentrations. If you know somebody who is pregnant, I mean, ideally, nobody would drink ever. But if somebody is pregnant and they have, you know, have a glass of wine every once in a while, there are not studies that show that that's a problem. There aren't studies that show it's fine, but there are not studies that would show that people have had problems after that. So people who drink moderately during pregnancy, and I mean really moderately, their children do not end up with behavioral, psychological, developmental problems at all. Um, in other countries, so here in the US, pregnant people are told, do not drink, period. In other countries, people are told, like, don't drink more than you know five drinks a week, or don't drink more than seven drinks a week and don't drink them all in one sitting. Um, so there's that. All alcohol-related developmental abnormalities associated with prenatal alcohol exposure are these fetal alcohol effects. Um, a prevalence is, you know, 80 to a few hundred per 1,000 births. Drinking during pregnancy does increase the risk of spontaneous abortion, but again, these are higher rates of drinking um, data do not prove that low levels of alcohol use during pregnancy are safe or that they are unsafe. And that's what I was saying before, is that you're not going to have a study that's going to prove that, that drinking is safe. But we also don't have studies that prove that a little bit of drinking is unsafe. So there's that. Do what you will with that information. However, again, going back, drinking heavily during pregnancy is horrible. Withdrawal. So the abstinence syndrome, blah, blah, the abstinence syndrome is medically more severe and more deadly than opioid withdrawal. If untreated, mortality can be as high as one in seven. So withdrawal stages, you have tremors, rapid heartbeat, hypertension, heavy sweating, loss of appetite, and insomnia. You need to get to the hospital during stage one. If you don't, because once you're in the hospital, they can help you maybe not have some of these other stages. Stage two is hallucinations. Stage three, delusions, disorientation, delirium. Stage four is seizures. If you see someone is in stage two or three, call an ambulance. You don't want somebody seizing in your car if you take them to the hospital. Detoxification should be carried out in an inpatient medical setting. Sedatives can be given during stage one and two to prevent stages three and four. Now we have different views here. The alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous view. Alcohol dependence is a progressive disease characterized by loss of control over drinking. This is the AA view. Only treatment is abstinence from alcohol. And the Alcoholics Anonymous view is the disease model, that alcohol dependence is the primary disease, and it's not necessarily a result of an underlying cause. The people that came up with Alcoholics Anonymous, good people, Bill W., um, good intentions. The idea was that before people who drank were demonized, it's their fault, they're bad people. And so the idea was, let's look at this differently. Okay, let's look at it as, a, it as a disease, and treatment will be abstinence. Okay, now AA was not developed by researchers, scientists. Um, it was not developed, well, using the scientific method, if you will. Um, but it was designed with good intentions. People have this idea that Alcoholics Anonymous is the way to go. What research seems to show is that people who want to be involved with Alcoholics Anonymous and are committed to it do well. It also shows that people who are court ordered to Alcoholics Anonymous do not do well. Um, 
so there's that. Alternative view, so the APA, American um, Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association, um, I don't know which APA they're talking about exactly, um, explicitly defines alcohol use disorder. So alcohol use disorder is a complex psychosocial disorder. Cognitive and genetic factors are of current scientific interest, okay? A little bit more generic there. Um, other things I want to say is that there are a lot of other ways to, to treat alcohol dependence. So for some people, abstinence is absolutely necessary. Uh, for other people, you can um, teach them to do controlled drinking, which is teaching people how to have a drink without then getting completely intoxicated or without then feeling like they need a drink every day. Some people are able to do that. Some people try to do that and it doesn't work and abstinence is the way to go. Um, there's a lot of different programs out there. I think, again, AA is good for people who want it. It is not good for everyone. Okay. So I, I just kind of want to leave you with that. Is it's good for some people. It's not good for everybody. There's a lot of other types of programs out there. Also, when it comes to alcohol um, treatment, a lot of money goes into research. A lot of money goes into treatment programs. Um, there are multiple programs out there. You don't actually see better results from inpatient programs, residential programs, versus, you know, intensive outpatient programs. However, one reason that people choose to do inpatient or residential programs is those places are easier for the family, right? The family can say, I need you to go away and take care of this. Um, it's not that you're pushing them away. It's, it's you're saying, I, I can't be the warden of the house that doesn't let you drink. I need somebody else to do that. And then, and then come back and we can work together. Um, it can be really difficult for family members to be the one that has to watch the person constantly so they don't use alcohol. Some people come back and drink immediately. Other people come back and don't. Big differences, individual differences. Um, every person is different. So therefore, the disease model works for some people. The controlled drinking works for other people. Um, you really have to think about each case by case, all right? So make sure that you remember Korsakoff syndrome. Make sure that you um, remember some of the bigger things that we talked about today, different types of alcohols, um, proof, what that means, things like that. All right, I will see you in the next chapter. Thank you.